There's been a crazy amount of activity in Starbase this week. We've had Booster 9 testing, we've had legendary vehicles getting scrapped, and, of course, lots and lots of water. Howdy, Star fans. Jack here with NSF, and we've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. First up, a new ship is being born here at Starbase, and I know this is probably something I say like every other week, but that's what we would expect from a factory designed to churn out vehicle after vehicle. During the last couple of weeks, Ship 30 stacking has been underway inside the high bay, with its forward dome section being the latest piece to go inside of it for stacking. Many other pieces of this vehicle are already staged outside in the ring yard, so stick around to find out when this baby will be finished. Next up, a slightly less glamorous vehicle under construction of the production site is the Ship 24.2 test article. As we discussed a couple of weeks ago, we think this might be a structural test article for a ship payload bay section. It had been sitting outside the mid bay for quite a while, but now has gone inside, perhaps to fully outfit it with sensors and whatever else is needed for testing whenever that should happen. Also at the production site this week, we saw two corner pieces for the fifth level of the Mega Bay installed. This level should be the last full one before SpaceX installs the roof of this facility. I still remember like two months ago when I asked when you thought this building would be ready to accept a vehicle. I think my answer was something along the lines of sometime around the end of the year. And I gotta say, with the speed that they're building this thing, I gotta revisit my prediction and say, I was wrong. Over the last week, crews at the Sanchez lot have been busy constructing the final pieces of this fifth section. You can see here they're almost complete, so watch out for when they roll out and are lifted and installed on the new Mega Bay. Moving right along, last week we bid farewell to Ship 27, which had been hanging out in the Rocket Garden for quite some time. This week, workers have been scrapping the final pieces and moving them aside in the scrapyard. Of course, the most sentimental farewell this week was to SM-15. This legendary ship was the first to fly to 10 kilometers and come back to land softly on the Starbase landing pad. I know some people were hoping that it was just going to be cut up so that it could be moved and displayed somewhere, but alas, this does not seem to be the plan. They've removed its flaps and have cut it up into several pieces. I'm not gonna lie, it's sad to see SM-15 go. I mean, if SpaceX really needed the room in the rocket garden, why not get rid of Booster 4 or Ship 20? They basically didn't do anything except for look cool. SN15 is historic. It belongs in a museum. But as sad as it is, we can tell ourselves that all subsequent vehicles built at Starbase will share heritage with SN15 and be standing on its shoulders. SpaceX learned a lot with that flight. And with that knowledge, these subsequent vehicles will go on to do even cooler things like make it to orbit, return and land back here at Starbase, and even land humans on the moon. So. Farewell, SN15. Thank you for all the data, and goodbye, my friend. While crews were dismantling SN15, the LR1750 crane at the Rocket Garden moved Ship 26 from the engine installation stand down onto the stand where Ship 27 had been sitting. Something tells me that this will be to make room for Ship 28 to be lifted onto the engine installation stand and get Raptors of its own. But where is Ship 28, you may ask? Well. Last week, it was moved to Massey's on the new mobile thrust simulator stand. This week, Ship 28 underwent cryogenic proof testing at Massey's, and now rollout closures have been posted on Cameron County's website for July 30th, 31st, and August 1st. It seems likely that these closures will be used to bring Ship 28 back to the production site from Massey's so it can be lifted onto the engine installation stand like I just mentioned and get its Raptors installed. After that, hopefully we'll see some more Starship static fire tests. We saw SpaceX do a similar thing with Booster 10 last week, bringing it to the Rocket Garden after it had undergone a cryogenic proof test at Massey's. I expect Booster 10 will be moved back into the Mega Bay for its own engine installations. Given that Ship 27 was scrapped and no work has been done on Ship 26 in quite a while, it makes sense that Booster 10 and Ship 28 can be expected to be the pair used in Starship's third integrated flight test. Speaking of the Star Factory expansion, it's, uh, well, Expanding. While the construction of this building had been done right next to the current Star Factory building and up to the northeast of it, now the expansion is being extended down to the southeast towards Highway 4. It'll be really interesting to see when the three main tents at the production site are removed to make way for the next part of the Star Factory expansion. A bit further down the road, we got a rare look inside the Starlink building, where teams have been installing a new bridge crane. You can even see stacks of Starlink version 2 satellites 
waiting patiently for a ship to take them to orbit. A lift can be seen inside working on the installation of the new crane, which had been helped by the yellow crane by the entrance. This new bridge crane will likely be used to install the Starlink satellites into the payload loader box that we've seen around Starbase. Then, that box will be used to introduce the Starlinks into ship payload bays. I am super excited to see this in action, hopefully soon, and hopefully with Ship 28. Speaking of action, one can definitely say that the center of action here in Starbase this week has been here at the orbital launch pad. Booster 9 underwent what SpaceX called a propellant load test on the orbital launch mount. This was the first time since the first integrated flight of Starship that a vehicle had been tested on the OLM at all. During this test, cryogenic liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen were loaded on the booster's oxygen and methane tanks respectively. This simulated a full propellant load sequence, as well as the subsequent detanking procedures. From what we observed that day, it seems like this test also included an extended hold, where teams just let the cryogens sit in the tanks for a while, before then detanking and refilling the ground tanks. Now it seems all that's left for Booster 9 is remaining engine tests, whether it's a spin prime or static fires or what have you. And of course, I'm super excited for static fires, and you know why? Because I love shock diamonds or mock diamonds, or whatever you want to call them. The chopsticks had been lifted up ever since the lift of Booster 9 happened, so SpaceX probably had kept them up there for the propellant load test for protection. Or maybe just in case an emergency D-stack of Booster 9 was necessary for some reason. After the test, we saw workers opening the hatch of Booster 9's liquid oxygen tank. They've been going inside of it over the past week since the test, but there may not be any reason to panic. This work inside of the tank may have been a result of whatever data SpaceX saw during the propellant load test, or maybe not. The scaffolding to this hatch was already installed when the test happened, so it's likely that they planned on going inside even before the test. Another thing that we've seen a lot of since Starship's first integrated flight test is loads of concrete work going on underneath and around the orbital launch mount, including the installation of loads of metal rebar. Speaking of metal, it's your last chance to get some of our metal prints. Now, we're not stopping doing these entirely, but we are clearing out older images to make room for newer ones. So, if you want to grace your wall with any of these images, if you think you might want one, now is the time to get one. This includes Max's epic Falcon Heavy lightning bolt shot. So, definitely hop over to shop.nasaspaceflight.com, and if you want one of these images, Get one now while you can. It now appears largely complete with several final pours having been seen over the last week, including the pouring of Fondag in the vicinity of the orbital launch mount next to the water-cooled steel plate system. And speaking of the W system, this week we had an amazing show with the very first full pressure test of the water W system. It was awesome. And also cool was the fact that we had some extraordinarily rare advanced warning that this test was going to happen via a tweet from SpaceX on Thursday that they were planning to conduct this test on Friday. Because of this, we were able to watch closely and see teams clearing the pad, sweeping dust away, spraying some water down, moving equipment away from the orbital launch mount, the whole nine yards. The very last thing to clear from the area were the chopsticks, which were raised a few minutes before the test as a precautionary measure. Then there was some rumbling and some venting, and sure enough, swoosh! Out came the water like some sort of slightly less gaudy Las Vegas fountain. It was amazing to see in person. The sheer pressure coming out of the plate as the water flew away from the OLM was incredible. During this test, you can see the water rushing out first a tad bit slowly, and then coming out at full power. This full pressure lasts for about 8 to 10 seconds, after which you can see, and hear, the very loud release of pressure from the water deluge tank farm behind the launch tower. But don't worry, this release is normal and expected. This release is done in order to reduce the pressure and flow of water through the plate so that it can safely be brought down to ambient pressure and terminate the test. It just so happens that this release sounds a lot like a static fire, which just goes to show you the amount of power that is required to push the water through the system. SpaceX then tweeted a cool close-up video where we can see exactly how the plate holes work. The central hexagon shoots water outward, while on the perimeter there are circular jets of water that seem to match the locations of the outer 20 engines. Certainly an interesting arrangement to have to protect the plate from the exhaust of 33 Raptor engines. A lot of people have asked us why have water shoot out the center, or why even use water at all? But 
Don't worry, we have an entire video coming soon on this very topic and exactly how the W system works in its entirety. So be sure you subscribe and hit the bell and do all the YouTube things because you're going to want to see this video when it comes out. Then after the deluge test, we saw that the chopsticks were lowered back down to their resting position. We also saw workers quickly returning to the pad to work on it and Booster 9. You can see how in this time lapse, in a matter of hours, all of the pad is pretty much as if nothing had happened earlier in the day. SpaceX is definitely wasting no time here getting the pad and the booster ready for the next integrated flight test. An interesting observation this week that workers have been using the dance floor underneath the orbital launch mount as some sort of elevator to bring up pieces of the equipment to the underside of Booster 9. We saw adapters that are used for Raptor engine removal being loaded onto the dance floor, which made us think an engine removal was about to happen. Thankfully, these were then removed from the dance floor a little bit later in the day, so it seems like it was all much ado about nothing. Whew! While all of this was happening at the orbital launch pad, Ship 25 kept getting worked on over on Pad B. Over the last few weeks, workers have been seen replacing broken or missing tiles on the vehicle's heat shield, which is a nice thing to do if they are indeed preparing it for flight. There's some indication that perhaps this ship might come off suborbital Pad B, as of recording, the tagline hooks have been installed back on the vehicle. These are what are used when a ship is lifted by crane so crews can stabilize the vehicle. Since you're watching this from the future, maybe you can tell us in the comments if by the time you're seeing this, Ship 25 has been lifted off of Pad B. Maybe not, maybe so, but either way, it's always fun to do a little bit of time traveling with y'all. And that's not all that happened this week either. After we recorded this episode, SpaceX rolled out a hot staging test article. The label on it reads, Booster 11 Forward Retain, Hot Stage Load Head. The test article has a booster forward section, the hot stage ring itself, and a ship aft single. They were moved to Massey's for structural testing in the Can Crusher test stand on Sunday night, and have since had crews working on them, getting the rig ready for testing. Awesome. I can't wait to see this set up on Booster 9. Do you think it'll pass the test though? Let us know in the comments. Well, as you can see, I was not kidding when I said a lot had happened this week. We had Booster 9 testing, we had Deluge testing, we had ships scrapped, we had all kinds of stuff going on. So now what's next? We expect the next milestone for Booster 9 here will be either a spin prime or a static fire test campaign. And then after that, hopefully launch. But either way, stay tuned and you better believe we'll be watching closely to see what happens next. So as always, thanks for watching and don't forget, be excellent to each other.